Hey everybody, my name is Scott Duncan. I am a professor of biology at Birmingham Southern College and I want to thank you for spending some time with me in this workshop to learn more about Alabama's surprising biodiversity. I first want to thank my friends at um, ARA for uh, not only organizing this event, um, but also um, offering the flexibility so that I could pre-record this presentation. Um, I have family down in the Florida Panhandle and I'm if you're listening to this as a recording, that means that I'm down there uh, helping out with the cleanup. Uh, I will try to, uh, to, to join in in the conversation after this presentation if I have access to, to, uh, to the internet once I'm down there. Um, there's no guarantee that that won't be the case. So thank you once again to my friends at ARA and thank you all for being here. So let's get started. Um, Alabama is an amazing state for biodiversity. Uh, about the time that I moved here from Florida, um, a report came out in 2002 that um, showed that Alabama is ranked number five in the U.S. for total species. Now, this is just among species that have been well documented across U.S. states. Um, you see them listed here at the bottom. Let me move my little image out of the way there so you can see that. Um, and so it's not all species. It doesn't have, for example, bacteria on there and things like that. Um, but for the species that are well studied, Alabama, Alabama ranks number five in the U.S. And that was a big surprise to a lot of people. And it's been part of my life mission to try to get the word out about Alabama um, so that it is better appreciated and our biodiversity is better protected as well. So this afternoon, we're going to talk about a few things. Um, we're going to talk about... Uh, what biodiversity we have and how much biodiversity we have in Alabama. I'm going to explain why we have that biodiversity and we're going to dive into why it matters. Now uh, this is the, the, the short version of, of the story. Um, several years ago uh, I published a book called Southern Wonders, Alabama's Surprising Biodiversity. It gets into these topics in much more detail. It's written for the general audience. It's not written for scientists and, and people with a technical background. It's written for everyone. So I encourage you to take, it, take a look at it. Some of the photographs that were donated by photographers uh, to be in the pages there are absolutely stunning. So take a look sometime. Um, I, th I think you'll enjoy it. All right, so let's get started. Um, what, so what species are we so famous for? Well, freshwater fishes to start with. Amongst U.S. states, we are number one for, for fish biodiversity. We have over 300 species in Alabama, which is over a third of North American species. And lots of endemic species, one that means species that are only found in Alabama, and many near endemic species that we are nice enough to share with other states like Tennessee and Georgia and Mississippi and Florida. Um, in some particular groups of fishes, we're pretty famous. Uh, we have, in terms of the minnows and the family Cyprinidae, we have over 85 species. In terms of um, darters, um, which uh, hug the bottom of our streams, uh, little, again, little fishes like the minnows, and these guys are brightly colored. We have over 80 species of them. Um, we have several, we have two species of cave fish, uh, one that is actually endemic to Alabama, and, it, and that one is actually known from just one cave on the entire planet um, up in northern Alabama. We have over 19 species of catfish in Alabama. Before I learned about um, the state and learned about its fishes, I thought there were only two kinds of catfish, fried and broiled. Um, but yeah, we are overrun with catfish in the state. Now to illustrate just how many species we have relative to some other regions of the U.S., uh, this slide was put together by Dr. Paul Johnson at the Alabama Aquatic Biodiversity Center. And this slide is often shown in presentations like this. And so you've probably seen it before, but it's stunning every time, I think. So um, in the Pacific Northwest, there's the Columbia River Basin, one of the more famous river basins in the U.S. And the Columbia gets lots and lots of money for all the management of the rivers up there because there's so much salmon. But the Columbia only has 33 native fish species. Uh, meanwhile, in the desert southwest, there's the Colorado River watershed. Um, that watershed also gets lots of federal and state funding to, um, because it's an important source of water for uh, the cities and the, and the uh, agriculture that takes place there. 
Um, but the Colorado River watershed only has 25 native fish species. Now let's take a look in Alabama. This is the Cahaba River watershed. Um, little tiny watershed in the middle, in the heart of Alabama. The Cahaba watershed, small compared to these other watersheds, and yet it has 128 native fish species and gets very little in terms of federal funding and conservation attention to protect those species. So that's some of the, um, the good news that we are blessed with uh, freshwater fishes, but we are also not getting the, they're not getting the protections that they need. Okay, moving on here. Uh, another category of freshwater organisms that we are famous for are snails. Uh, we are the number one state for snail biodiversity with almost 150 species, probably more. We're still working on the genetics of this. And um, if we look at snail distribution across the planet, it's, as it turns out, uh, we are a globally significant hotspot, which means that it, we're one of those spots on the planet that has more snails than anywhere else. And if you want to protect freshwater snails, this is a place to come. Um, many of the snails that are found in the state are endemic. Um, almost, uh, well, almost 193% of the species in the state are just found in Alabama, which is a very high level of endemism. Another group we're famous for are mussels, river mussels. Uh, we have over 180 species. We're the number one U.S. state for river mussels. And like snails, we are a globally significant hotspot. We, some of our rivers have more um, mussels in them than um, entire continents um, around the world. Uh, that's how that's how much how much our rivers and streams are loaded with with mussels. Another category is an underappreciated category, and that's our crayfish, also known as crawfish, crawdads, mud bugs, whatever you want to call them. We are still the number one state for crayfish species. Again, uh, we have um, about 80, over 80 different species, and there's a bunch of undescribed species that taxonomists are still um, in the process of former, formally describing. So when all said and done, we'll probably have 100 uh, or more uh, crayfish species in the state. It's a relatively poorly studied group of organisms. All right, I'm going to throw in here Alabama's carnivorous plant biodiversity. We are definitely the number one U.S. state and a global hotspot for carnivorous plant biodiversity. Um, these are related to our rivers and streams because they are all part of our system of wetlands. Carnivorous plants, uh, every one of them, um, is a wetland plant of some sort. And so um, this all water ties together all these taxa. Now there, if we take a step back and look more broadly and we look at Alabama's herps, um, uh, which is a, a, a term for both reptiles and amphibians. We are number three uh, amongst U.S. states for herpetological diversity. That includes things like uh, the salamanders, um, like you see here, um, the cave salamander and the eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, one of my favorites. Um, we are also pr um, pretty famous for our frog diversity. We have more frog species in Alabama known here than any other state in the U.S. Same is true for freshwater turtle diversity. And in fact, here we have yet another global um, thing to brag about here. We have more freshwater turtles um, than most places on the planet. Um, and the Mobile Tensaw Delta, the lower portions of the delta, have uh, more turtles than pretty much any spot on the planet per area. There's one spot that competes with it um, in the, um, below the uh, Himalayan mountains. Um, so we're, again, rocking it out when it comes to these different groups of organisms, um, these uh, reptiles and amphibians. If we go underground, we see the pattern continues. Alabama is, uh, enjoys part of a region in the southeast that has tremendous amounts of cave biodiversity. So in the temperate zones of the world, that would be that everything outside of the tropics, uh, we are the third most biodiverse cave system in, in the world. Um, and we share that um, with Georgia and Tennessee. It's that area where those three states come together that has so many species of cave organisms. And we've only explored about 10% of the caves by biologists have. So 
Um, who knows what else is down there? We'll probably wind up at the top of world rankings in the temperate zone by the time we're done. Okay, so we got lots of species in Alabama, and that leads to the question, why? Why do we have so many species in the state? And um, an answer to that is that we've got lots of ecosystems. So let's take a look at what we got. We have lots of wetlands in the state, from swamps to rivers to bogs. And these wetlands harbor much of our biodiversity. You might have noticed that those taxa about which I was bragging a few minutes ago, uh, nearly all of them are groups of organisms that are found in our wetlands. So there's no surprise that Alabama is loaded with um, wetland ecosystems. But we also have a great diversity of upland ecosystems as well. And this is certainly by far my favorite upland ecosystem. This is the longleaf pine ecosystem. It is uh, dominated by these majestic trees, the longleaf pines, and um, in an understory that is thick with plants. And because of all the plant carpeting the bottom of these um, ecosystems, you've got lots of reptiles and amphibians and insect species as well. What is key to maintaining this ecosystem is recurrent wildfires that come through and they burn off trees that would love to invade all those bright sunny spaces and take over all that space. And if those trees, those oaks, those maples and hickories and so forth were to move in, they would shade out the understory and you would lose all the grasses and wildflowers and you would lose all the reptiles and amphibians and, and other critters that make their home in that understory. Um, so longleaf pine is like one of, one of our um, most important, in terms of biodiversity uh, in the uplands, one of our most important ecosystems. What is, longleaf pine are fairly famous if you, if you know a little bit about Alabama's ecology. Uh, what's less famous are our prairies. There are many different types of prairies found in the southeast, and many of those are found in Alabama. They range from prairie ecosystems you can find just above the tide line in lower Alabama to uh, patch prairie ecosystems found up near the Tennessee uh, border. Um, in the middle of the state, there's a thick band of, of uh, geography that used to be almost continuous prairie called the Black Belt. Um, and the important thing about uh, prairie ecosystems is that it's a combination of soil factors and recurring fires that keep trees out. And when you keep trees out, just like in the longleaf pine ecosystem, it allows all these plants to thrive, plants that aren't found in forested ecosystems and would quickly be lost if forests um, were allowed to take over. Sadly, like a lot of our ecosystems, we've lost most of the prairies in the state. Um, prairies and longleaf pine habitats are now um, just a few patches uh, left in the state. But fortunately, there are folks working on restoring these in some of our areas. So, um, you know, we're, we're moving forward on, on that, but it's, it's, a, it's a slow crawl right now. Now, um, other ecosystems we find up in the mountains of Alabama. Um, Alabama is not typically known outside of the region as a mountainous state until you come here and see that, oh yeah, those are mountains. Now, we actually do glorify some kind of small mountains and call them mountains. We do that here in Birmingham, that's for sure. Um, but throughout the state, you can find some mighty tall mountains. And wherever you find mountains, be they small or tall, they offer lots of ecological diversity. Some slopes face west, some face east, some south, some north. Um, some are dry, some are wet, uh, some are at high elevations or low elevations, some are at the bottom of or slopes at the bottom of a valley and some are up on top of a ridge, some are on limestone, some are on sandstone. You get the idea, right? The more natural variation that you have in a landscape, the more species you're going to find there in that in that region. And mountains add a tremendous amount of uh, diversity to our ecological landscape. Now, if you happen to be wandering the world and meet any biologists that know about Alabama, they'll probably know mostly about our rivers and streams because they are so full of so many beautiful and fascinating species and lots of them. And it's for our rivers and streams that the state is most famous. And that's why we are up near the top in terms of state rankings for total biodiversity. Now, this is uh, again showing you that chart I showed you before, uh, the top 10 states for biodiversity. And this hasn't changed too much since it came out um, around 2002. Um, but what I want to illustrate here is that Alabama has been less well studied 
compared to Arizona and New Mexico, the states that are just ahead of it. And let's face it, Arizona and New Mexico are more arid states. It's really hard to hide species there. Whereas in Alabama, pretty much the whole state's like a jungle. You can hide lots of species in Alabama. And that's why we are still discovering species in the year 2020 in the state. So many of us suspect that um, either when all the exploration is, is said and done and or when we include on our species lists all those little organisms that are out there like nematodes and, and other organisms that didn't make it onto this tally, um, that Alabama is going to rank um, up near the top, maybe in position three. And some folks even think that we will be at the very top. But for right now, until somebody does all that work, we'll just have to settle for number five which is pretty good. Okay, so we've got um, lots of ecosystems in the state. That begs the question, why? If we want to understand why we got so many species, then we need to understand why there's so many ecosystems in Alabama. So let's dig into that. The first reason is climate. Um, climate um, in Alabama um, is, of course, very warm. We get lots of sunlight and we get lots of heat. Now, those two are actually different things to consider. Um, for example, um, two sides of a mountain might get the same amount of overall heat, um, but one side gets more sunlight than the next. So we can kind of separate those out, um, although usually they're, they're correlated. They, the point that I want to make here, though, really, is that because Alabama is a tall state instead of a long state side to side like Tennessee, we wind up having some portions of the state that are really tropical climate for much of the year. That would be uh, lower Alabama. And then we've got portions of the state that are far north enough that they're much more like the uh, um, the interior of, of the continent, much, much colder. There's a temperature gradient of about 10 degrees Fahrenheit from the Tennessee line to the Alabama coast. And that's a tremendous range of temperature um, across which you've got lots of species that are found only in warm climates and those that are only found in colder climates. So because we're a tall state, we wind up having a lot of climate diversity relative to many other states. Okay, now another component of climate is that we get lots of rain. This is a rainfall map, annual rainfall map across the lower 48. And you see there's two regions that get a lot of rain. There's the Pacific Northwest, and then there's the Southeast. And in the Southeast, Alabama is at the center of the bullseye in terms of rain intensity. And the combination of high amount of sunlight and, um, and heat plus the rain makes for very good growing conditions for plants in the state. And this is important because you can't sustain um, productive ecosystems without plant growth. And because we're such, we get so much rain and light, we wind up, have, we wind up sustaining many very lush types of ecosystems around the state. And those ecosystems, all that plant growth sustains lots of animal species as well. So this is a major reason why the state has so many species. Um, since we're talking about climate, I got to throw in there lightning. Lightning's part of our climate pattern. Um, earlier when I spoke about prairies and uh, longleaf pine ecosystems and explained that fire was important to keeping them in their natural state, well, where do you think started all those fires long ago? Um, that would be lightning. Uh, Native Americans also uh, adapt, adapted to using fire in the southeast to manage the landscapes. Most of the southeast, if not all of it, was under active management by Native Americans uh, when the first Europeans arrived. And of course, the Europeans stepped off the ship and they're like, hey, look at all this land for us and nobody's using it. Now, they were just blind and they did not understand or really care that the landscape was uh, under active management and fire was an important tool. Um, some of the Euro-American settlers did use fire and that helped sustain these ecosystems for a bit, but eventually we stopped using fire and allowing it to range across the landscape. And um, for that reason, fire dependent ecosystems are on the decline in the southeast. Okay, so climate, very important for explaining why Alabama has so many species, but how important? Let's take a look at that. Um, this is a map showing you um, what are called biomes across the, the planet. A biome is an aggregation of ecosystems that share similar characteristics. So for example, you see um, in dark green here near the equator, you see the tropical rainforests of the world. 
Well, if you go to any of the tropical rainforests, you'll find different types of ecosystems embedded within that biome. So I just am emphasizing here that these colored areas are the, the, the level of ecological classification that is the step above the ecosystem. And it's a way for folks like me that are interested in biogeography to understand the overall patterns on the planet and what causes them and what the implications are. And what I want to illustrate here, and you can see with these red arrows, is that at the latitudes where Alabama is found, we have the great deserts of the world. We have, for example, the uh, desert southwest uh, in the U.S. in Mexico. We've got the Saharan Desert and the deserts of, of the Middle East and South Asia. And then in the southern hemisphere, we've got Australia, South Africa, and parts of South America. However, Alabama is clearly not a desert. Why doesn't Alabama look like this? That would be too bad. I love desert ecosystems, but this is not Alabama. What's going on? This is your answer. It's the Gulf of Mexico and the loop current. Okay, so we're looking at a map here of the Gulf of Mexico, and you can ignore for now these little circles over to the left. These are just little eddies that happen in this pocket of the Gulf of Mexico. What I want to draw your attention to instead is this big ribbon, which is illustrating the what's called the loop current. And the loop current comes from the Caribbean Ocean down here um, at the bottom right, and it squeezes through the um, Yucatan Strait between the Yucatan and Cuba. And as you do with any amount of water you squeeze through a narrow space, it accelerates in speed, and it winds up speeding through that gap and up towards our doorstep up here in the southeast, including Alabama. Now, this is related to our climate and to biodiversity because the loop current brings, brings warm water to our doorstep all year long. That means that you're going to get heat delivered to the southeast during the winter, which makes our winters more mild, and more mild winters means longer growing seasons and more species can survive here. The other thing is that that heated water winds up evaporating off the Gulf of Mexico and then surface winds bring that moisture into the southeast. And that, that moisture comes in as water vapor in its gaseous form and then it comes down as rain. About 50% of the rainfall in the eastern United States came directly off the Gulf of Mexico within the several hours to days of that water evaporating and the rest of it is recycled water that keeps evaporating and falling in place on the continent. So it's because of the Gulf of Mexico that we have um, a very lush set of ecosystems in the southeast in Alabama in particular. All right, so climate's pretty important, but how important is it? Well, this map helps illustrate that. This is a map of the southeast, and what I've done here is to superimpose the numbers uh, of state rankings for total biodiversity. So you see um, that Alabama ranked number five is right there, um, and you see Georgia number six, Florida seven, and so forth. Okay, And if you look at the states surrounding Alabama, you'll notice some big discrepancies in total biodiversity rankings. Mississippi, for example, is essentially a mirror image of Alabama. Um, it's got the same north-south gradient. It's got access to the coast. It actually has more coast, um, and it's about as wide as Alabama. And yet Mississippi, bless their hearts, is only ranked at 17 in terms of species biodiversity in the U.S. Louisiana, 18. South Carolina, 14. And those states also, including Mississippi, we, they all share the same characteristics I just talked about. Lots of sunlight, lots of heat, lots of moisture, lots of lightning. So if that's the case, then clearly something other than climate is really important for shaping these biodiversity patterns and why Alabama is such a superstar. Let's take a look at that. The answer to that is geologic diversity. This is the biggest reason why Alabama has so many species relative to its neighboring states. Now, geologic diversity um, is represented in a map like this. This is the geologic map of the state. And honestly, it's a, it's a simplified map. The actual map spans the floor to the ceiling and is about many feet wide. And only then can you pack in all the diversity that we have um, in the state in terms of geology. 
Now what each of these colors represents is either a different type of rock that is found at the surface, and that would, that would apply to everything in this north, eastern, and central part of Alabama. Those are all rock types at the surface. But below, um, below the line that I'm trying to illustrate with my cursor here, um, all these bands of color represent different types of sediments. These are ancient marine sediments that were part of the seafloor when sea levels were much higher around uh, 50 million years ago and earlier. But as the, as the oceans receded and um, dropped in elevation, um, the, the seafloors were exposed and those are the soils that are now these different bands that you have in the lower half of Alabama. Okay, So um, the main overall point here is that Alabama has a tremendous variation in the rocks and soils that are found in the state. Compare that with Mrs. Mm, hang on. Okay, restarting here in just a second, where I said compare that with Mississippi. Actually, go back here and delete that statement about comparing to Mississippi, and then restart with um, what you're going to talk about in your next slide. Okay, restarting in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so what's so special about geology? Geology influences several factors that shape our ecosystems. To begin with, geology influences what type of rock is exposed at the surface. Different rocks weather into different types of soils. Um, here I have um, some pictures of four different types of ecosystems in Alabama, kind of mushed together here, and each of them has wildly different types of soils, from the sands that you find on the beaches that are very, very low in nutrients and do not hold water very well, to the rich uh, soils that you find on river floodplains that are uh, lush with nutrients and hold moisture and are very, very deep. Um, so we've got a tremendous range of soil variation in the state and those soils support different types of ecosystems. The other way that geology influences our um, biodiversity is by creating topographic diversity in the landscape. So topography is the study of the shape of landforms, and I referred to earlier about all the different types of landforms that you can find in the mountains. That's what this is illustrating. This is illustrating um, the nine different types of topographic positions you can find in the um, northeastern portion of Alabama, and each of them supports a unique combination of plant and animal species. If the entire region of Alabama was flat or flattish, maybe even hilly, um, there would be many, many fewer different types of topographic, um, topographically uh, derived ecosystems, and we would have many, many fewer species in the state. So these are three ways that, uh, that uh, geology influences um, the biodiversity we have in Alabama. Different types of rocks and sediments at the surface um, that creates different soil types, and we've got different uh, types of topographic positions. Now let's compare, to get a grasp on like how important this geologic diversity is to the state, let's take a look at uh, Mississippi and Alabama side by side. And what you should see here pretty immediately is that Mississippi lacks the same amount of geologic diversity that Alabama has. And this helps explain why Mississippi is ranked number 17 in terms of total biodiversity and Alabama is ranked number 5. If this, the Mississippi-Alabama territory had been divided up differently and Mississippi got a piece of the mountains, then we would be telling a very different story here today. All right, now let's get a feel for how important geology is for shaping diversity of state rankings. So this is a, a, a simplified geologic map of the lower 48 states. I know, Hawaii and Alaska never get their, their, uh, the attention they deserve, nor do the states like uh, the future, hopeful future states like Puerto Rico, Washington, DC, and, and, and a bunch of uh, islands in the Pacific that need to be US states as well. But we'll work here with this map of the lower 48. And what I want to highlight are just those states that are in the lower section of the US, the so-called Sun Belt. And if we look to the west, we see that um, the western states in the Sun Belt 
are ranked number one, two, three, and four for total biodiversity. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. He said that water was really important. Rainfall was really important for why Alabama has so many species. Um, and that is true. And these states are indeed mostly very dry. What's different is that these states are very large and they have a tremendous amount of geologic diversity. And so they get a combination of um, lots of different types of mountains, um, much more um, much more ecological diversity derived from mountains, and many of them are just unfairly huge, like Texas and California. Uh, Texas and California have both mountains and deserts and forests and, and, and coasts, so who can compete with that really? <clears throat> so let's take a look at the, the, the eastern U.S. This will maybe be more elucidating about the role that geology plays in, in biodiversity. If we look at South Carolina, Mississippi and Louisiana, um, which are all sort of mid-tiered states in terms of biodiversity, um, we see that um, if you look at the colors on the map, they don't have a lot of geologic variation. Uh, in fact, they're kind of similar to one another. If you look in, then at Alabama and Georgia, which have very similar amounts of geologic diversity, you see that Alabama and Georgia are very similar in their, in their um, species diversity rankings at ranked number five and six res respectively. Now, you might have noticed that there's a state that I haven't illuminated here yet with a little uh, number, and that would be my home, my birth state of Florida. Well, Florida actually has very little geology, geologic diversity um, but it also has high degree of species in it. So what's going on with that? Well, this gets back to something I slipped in while you might not have been noticing earlier, and that is that regions that have more environmental diversity have more species. Environmental includes climate as well as geology. In Florida, because it swings so far south and, all, and far to the north, it covers a lot of climate variation. And so South Florida um, has many species that are native to the Caribbean, as well as in North Florida, you find species that are found in, in states that are far to the north of Florida. So Florida makes up for its lack of geologic diversity by having a high degree of climate diversity. Okay, so all of this to say that geology is very important for explaining why Alabama has so many species relative to other states. Okay, the third and final thing that we'll talk about here as to why Alabama has so many species in it has to do with our rich evolutionary past. And I'm going to use the word evolutionary in a more broad term to include both the biological evolution but also uh, geologic changes through deep time. As it turns out, a lot of the geologic changes that have happened on our planet are driven by the biology and vice versa. It's really hard to separate them out. Um, but that's not going to slow us down, so let's get started. Um, there's a very rich stories that can be told about Alabama and its geologic past and how it relates to the way that we live in the state and relates to our biodiversity. And nobody tells those stories better than uh, Jim Lacefield, um, who's written a couple of books. Um, called Lost Worlds in Alabama Rocks. And um, he, there's an earlier version and a newer version. And, I, and if you find any of this just a little bit interesting, maybe even if you don't, I encourage you to get his book and read it. Um, it is written for people like me that have never had a course in geology, and it makes geologic, geology and studying geology of the state, lot, it's very fun and very relatable. So I strongly encourage you to check out his book. Okay, now one of the stories that Jim tells in his book is, about how um, millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, the continental plates of the world rammed together to form a large supercontinent called Pangaea. And the future home of Alabama was the land that's marked there with an arrow on your screen. And it was right there at the collision zone where South America and Africa and North America collided. Well, that collision uh, had some repercussions in terms of the surface geology. It created the Appalachian Mountains. So we can thank the um, collision of three continents that goes back about 325 million years ago for the reason why we've got so many mountains in the state. Now, 
300 million plus years ago is a long time for those mountains to wear down. Uh, back in the day, they were as tall as the Andes or the Alps, but now they are, of course, our beloved um, sort of soft uh, Appalachian mountains that we have in the state, but still they harbor lots of biodiversity. So what is it about mountains in the state and what have they done for us to really help us out in terms of biodiversity? Well, first of all, they provide the topographic diversity, they provide surface bedrock diversity, and they provide climate variation because the climate is different on the tops of our mountains than it is at the base of our mountains or from the north to the south sides of the mountains. You all, you knew this already. This was just a review and I'm just illustrating how things that have happened in our deep evolutionary past have influence on the biodiversity that we have on our landscape today. But there's another way that I want to look at mountains and how it has led to the evolution of all the species that we have in the state of Alabama. And for that, we need to look at our watersheds. You knew this was coming back to rivers, and here we are. This is a map next of the major watersheds of the state. Um, and there's, depending on how you combine them or split them out, there's um, anywhere from a dozen to about 17 different watersheds in the state. Um, but the point of this is that the state is divided into um, many different large watersheds that are, they, they, many of them are connected where their rivers join near the coast, but for long stretches of the river's length, the, the surrounding watershed is isolated from the adjacent watersheds. So for example, um, if you were a fish in the Black Warrior River right here, and you wanted to swim um, from, say, Village Creek in um, Birmingham, Alabama, to the Cahaba River, which is just a couple of miles away, you would have to swim your little fish butt all the way down the Black Warrior River, all the way down the Tom Bigby River, then up the Alabama River, up the Cahaba River, all the way up to Birmingham. Okay, That is important because this means that many different aquatic organisms wind up being kind of isolated in their watersheds. And if you know anything about evolution and, um, and, the, and the emergence of new species via evolution, you know that places like islands are nature's laboratory for cranking out new species over long periods of time. Uh, islands typically have uh, many species that are not found elsewhere because populations get stuck out there on islands and then they adapt to local conditions. Well, guess what? The same thing happens in our watersheds. And that's why you wind up having so many species of small fishes and crayfishes and snails and mussels that are found in Alabama and not found elsewhere. Those would be our endemic species. Other species emerged in this milieu of watersheds and then have over long periods of evolutionary time been able to spread out. But again, their, their origin goes back to the fact that we've got this this large area of the southeast that is divided up into these distinct watersheds. And that is why we have um, so many aquatic species in the state. And these points that are popping up are basically uh, re reiterating that. Um, I'll throw in one more point. One other reason why the southeast has so many species compared to places up north isn't just the climate, it's the fact that we didn't get crushed by glaciers during the ice ages. And so we had our ecosystems surviving in one form or another over the last uh, two and a half million years during the ice ages. That's a whole different story for another day. Okay, moving on here. Um, so I'm a conservation biologist, and conservation biology is concerned with preventing future extinctions. When I started my career about 30, 35 years ago or so, conservation biology was just about um, protecting other species from extinction, and we're now at the point where we're also concerned with our own future and our own possible extinction. Um, sounds like an exaggeration if you're new to thinking about this, but it's not. Um, again, we'll have to get into that topic on a different day. Um, I want to focus now on the problems with biodiversity and maintaining biodiversity in the state of Alabama, because we got some bad news here. Um, if you look at the state rankings for total species that have gone extinct, Alabama ranks number two. The only state ahead of it is Hawaii with 217 extinctions. Now, I mentioned earlier that islands are nature's natural laboratories for species evolution. 
And so islands are really a distinct kind of geographic situation. So if we just look at states in the U.S. that are on the continent, well, what do you know? Alabama ranks number one for species extinctions. And the state that would rank number two, California, isn't even close. It's down by uh, almost 40 species. So what is going on with Alabama? Why do we have so many extinct species in the state? Well, it has to do with the way that we treated our rivers. And if you saw my, um, my keynote presentation, you'll know that um, a major reason for why we've lost so many species in the state has to do with the industrialization of our rivers, specifically channelizing them, um, which means digging them out for shipping, and even more um, important was the damming of all, nearly all the large rivers in the state of Alabama and the subsequent extinctions that those caused. All right, now extinctions are not just a thing of the past. Um, it would be we could feel better about our future if we could say, well, yeah, we were kind of sloppy about the way we lived on the landscape, and we don't have to worry about extinctions anymore, fortunately. However, sadly, that's not the case. Um, we are, let's skip through those stats. If you look at the total number of species that we have in the state that are on the U.S. endangered species list, we have 136. I looked that up just this morning. It's September 17th. I think, to 2020. And on that list, um, there are 113 animals and 84% of them are freshwater aquatic species. Most of those are mussels and the rest are divided amongst uh, snails and crayfishes and, and fishes um, and a few others thrown in. Alabama, if you look at at-risk species, which doesn't mean they're on the endangered species list, it means it's they can be endangered, but they might also just have characteristics that make them vulnerable to extinction. So if you look at all the species that are at risk of extinction, Alabama ranks number four in the U.S. among states. Um, and we're number three for species that are on the endangered species list. So folks, we are not out of the woods yet in terms of uh, extinctions in the state of Alabama. We've got a lot of work to do. Now, um, some of you, and maybe all of you, already care about biodiversity and care about little critters and streams that most folks will never see. But it's important that people like me and others that are advocates for biodiversity are able to answer this question. So what? Why does biodiversity matter? Well, there's lots of different ways that you can answer this question. And it's always important to know where you are, the person you're speaking with is coming from. Um, because you can tailor your responses to, to them, to, to connect with their values and what matters to them. But here's sort of a framework that I think can work um, in a variety of situations. First of all, there are two different ways that we value biodiversity. The first one is called intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is the value that something has as its own end to itself, its own interests. I believe that each of you has intrinsic value. I may, may never meet you in person. You may not have or offer anything to help me out in my life, but you have value. And um, I think that you should continue existing because you have intrinsic value, right? So applying that to biodiversity, um, intrinsic value, those of us that, including myself, that, that believe that other organisms have intrinsic value, it's a way of saying that other living organisms have just as much right to exist as we humans do. OK, um, another way to think about this is that Earth is their only home and it's only fair that we share it with them. So this is the argument for preserving biodiversity that emphasizes intrinsic value. Now, for a long time, conservationists have um, used this as an argument for why we should protect species, but it hasn't been as effective as we need it to be. Um, it, this argument appeals to some people, but many people have a very different worldview, one that is much more interested in um, putting humans at the center of, of the universe and want to know like what biodiversity can do for us. And it's important that we be able to explain that because there are some deep connections between our very survival and biodiversity. So let's talk about that for a moment. There is this second way of valuing biodiversity. It's called instrumental value. 
This means that biodiversity is an instrument to our ends. It's something that we would use to accomplish whatever our goals are. Now, instrumental value, I'm going to use a framework for explaining that that's called ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the things that ecosystems do for us for free. Sounds like a complicated term, but it's something that you're already familiar with. I'm going to break it down into the four different types of ecosystem services. There are supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural services. Importantly, these services are critical because they are they lead to our well-being, as you see here at the circle at the bottom of the screen. Without these ecosystem services, we can't have security. We can't have good health. We don't have the basic materials for a good life. And our social relations break down with one another. Biodiversity is related to these and other constituents of well-being. Now, let's take a look at what some of these are so we can wrap our heads around this a bit more. Supporting services. These are those services that are, um, these are the processes and ecosystems that are necessary for just keeping life on Earth. That's the cycling of nutrients, soil formation, photosynthesis, production of oxygen by plants, and more. These are, again, the supporting to make sure that other species can survive, including humans, on the planet. Okay, those are supporting services. Another type of service that is of course, dependent on supporting services are regulatory services. These are ecosystem processes that moderate natural phenomena. So, for example, when rivers rise uh, during a flood, uh, floodplains can absorb that water and reduce flooding in human inhabited areas downstream. Uh, similarly, you have uh, coastal wetlands that protect uh, cities from storm surges and, and high tide flooding. Um, another one that I want to emphasize here as an example of regulatory services is pollination. I think most people by now are aware that our, our bee populations are under threat. Um, we are, however, dealing with pollination, pollinator problems around the world. Pollination uh, populations are crashing throughout the world. And this is related to us on a daily basis because of the foods that we eat. As it turns out, about 75% of all the plant crops that we humans rely on the world over, 75% of them are pollinated by animals. And most of those animals are not bees that we truck around in beehives and stuff. Most of those animals are coming from natural ecosystems that are adjacent to our agricultural areas. So when we lose those habitats, we're losing the pollinators that we rely on to help make the food that we, that we eat every day. All right, so that's a good example of a regulatory service. Another type of service is cultural services. These are not necessarily things that we absolutely must have to survive, but they enrich our existence and our relationship with one another. So this would be examples of, of us doing nature recreation, whether it's a walk in the park or paddling uh, on, a, on a turbulent river. Um, we also benefit from having beauty in our landscape that's added by, by species. Um, I, I live in Birmingham and I can look up at Red Mountain and parts of it are, are, are nicely forested and that enhances the beauty of our community. If it was just a barren moonscape like it was in the era of mining, it would be kind of depressing to look up there instead. We also find a creative inspiration in nature, whether it's uh, visual arts like you see in the painting at the lower right, or poetry or you know um, various expressions of our faith for those that that have a spiritual um, worldview all of that is is tied to cultural services when without biodiversity we don't have that finally i want to point out one of the more obvious types of services that's provisioning services these are the um, the things that we extract from nature so that's water food materials and medicines and so forth so these are um, things that we rely on on a daily basis. And without these services, we just can't make it on this planet. Now, an example of this is medicines. Um, the top 20 selling drugs in the U.S. were all, the chemicals that are important to them were all discovered in nature. Um, some of them are synthesized in the lab now, but others are still extracted from nature. And the world's forests and coral reefs um, 
are, are a living pharmacy for us to discover new drugs that will help us with the with the ailments that are that are that are plaguing us. So when we keep biodiversity around, we're keeping open the possibility of new drug discoveries that um, can save lives. All right, so let's finally answer that question succinctly. Why save biodiversity? If you're just concerned about humans, what's why bother? Well, it's that ecosystems provide more services and higher quality services when their native species are present and their populations are strong. This has been one of the most important findings from the field of ecology in the last two to two and a half decades, is showing the connection between biodiversity and these emergent properties from ecosystems that we humans um, so desperately depend on. So that's why we should save biodiversity. It is in our own selfish uh, self-interest. All right, so what can you do to help save biodiversity? Well, I would say you have already started by listening to this talk all the way through because you're learning. That's one of the most important things that all of us can do um, towards making this world a better place, and that is to keep learning because um, there is so much to learn and no one can understand it all. Um, individual action through learning, doing, sharing, and leading is really critical right now so that we can be informed um, citizens working together, and that's this next step, is networking and advocacy. We need to work together to change the systems that we have in place now. What we've got in place now is not working. It's leading to uh, tremendous uh, human uh, suffering and misery uh, uh, around the world and, and right here in the southeast. Um, and it's, of course, leading to the loss of biodiversity. We are in the sixth mass extinction crisis on this planet. And this one, this number six, this is caused entirely by us. So what needs to happen next is that once, once people are taking individual action, they, which is good, it's important, but you also need to network with others. And that's important why you're as participating in the water rally, because this is your opportunity to meet with others, to network, to learn from each other, and to join forces to advocate for social justice and for environmental justice and for biodiversity conservation and protection. And all of this will lead to systemic change, um, which is building an inclusive and sustainable society so that humanity and biodiversity can thrive indefinitely on this planet. But all of it begins with individual action, which is not to say that it's up to us, that we alone are responsible. No, we have to change the systems that are in place. And honestly, we don't have much time. Um, we have about 10 years in terms of before we start getting into the really bad components of um, climate change that um, that climate scientists have predicted for us. We really need to be doing a lot this next decade. Okay, so um, that is that is our our future um, and what where I think that we need to go and where I think that we are actually going. Here in Alabama, we're fortunate to have so many species and the ecosystems to support them. Um, we've lost a lot of species, yes, but a lot of species are still here, and it's and a lot of species, of course, are are they're all worth protecting. And it's not just the right thing to do to protect these species, in my opinion, but it's also the smart thing to do for all those ecosystem services uh, that we that we talked about, and it's the smart thing to do for us as well as for future generations. And so um, that's the main message that I want you to learn about Alabama's biodiversity today. And I thank you all very much for your time and um, keep, up the, keep up the great work and, and keep up the fight.